I'm Arthel Neville. Time now for Sunday House Call. And I'm Eric Sean. Welcome as always. Joining us, Dr. Mark Siegel, professor of medicine at NYU's Lango Medical Center, who's also the author of The Inner Pulse, Unlocking the Secret Code of Sickness and Health. And Dr. David Samadhi, chairman and professor of urology at Lenox Hill Hospital and chief of robotic surgery. Good to see you both. Great, Great to see you. As always. I, is... You picked a nice color for today. Oh, well, thank you. You know, I try. My mom's happy about that. So there, here we go. <laughs> this is very fascinating. We're talking about bionic limbs no longer unique to science fiction now they're reality doctors perform the world's first bionic hand reconstructions on three Austrian patients who are now able to do just about everything so the question is how commonplace will these limbs become and how reliable is the technology Dr. Siegel we're going to start with you I mean is the future now the future is now the future is now there's 1.7 million people in the United States that are missing some limb, at least one limb. And for those people out there or someone out there that knows them, this is an amazing day. The, the Department of Defense has been working on research on these kinds of artificial limbs for about seven or eight years now. And they got approval last May for something called DECA, D-E-K-A. That's like Luke from, from, from the Star Wars trilogy because it's a mind-driven limb. In other words, your mind drives your upper arm to then s fire the prosthetic limb. So What's new about that is... is it connect, I'm sorry, is it connected to nerves? I mean, right, 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 exactly. Nerves in the upper arm were attached to the, to, the, uh, to the prosthetic limb, and then your brain was able to fire it. That's the one that was approved last year. Let me tell you what's new today. In the study from Austria, they took some nerves from the thigh because they said those nerves from the upper arm aren't enough. They're not strong enough, Arthel. So they transplanted nerves from the thigh into the, into the, the arm, what, what's left of the arm, and then into the prosthesis. The key here is mind control. The key here is mind control. You're able to control the prosthetic limb with your mind, pick up marbles, put a key in a lock, do a zipper. All the things you need to do with daily function, that's the new game, and that's the future. I, I think what's interesting about this is that the only way that this is going to work is that the whole robotic technology, also the technology of, of uh, the nerves and the muscles, all of that science has to come together for this to work. So this is the three patients between 2011 and 2014 that had some nerve injury to brachial plexus. Brachial plexus is a whole group of nerves on the upper arm that had some injury. So now they have no function on the lower part of their arms. What it involves is actually a lot more complex than what we, we Mark just mentioned. What they have to do is they have to basically amputate and they have to be willing to go for that. They have to amputate the part of arm. They have to bring the muscle and the nerves and, and repair it, that part that's missing. So the whole contact between the brain and the nerves would function and then bring the prosthesis and do it. A very complex process, but it's a huge breakthrough in this field that's going to work. And now well, I want you to pay attention to the video that you just showed, because to understand how sensitive this is, they're taking an egg and move it over, right? And, and if you don't have a feedback from those, you could crush that, that egg or the way they're moving. So look at that. Yeah. That process by itself is so sensitive. Right. And now they also have added some sort of a feedback from the prosthesis back up, which is tremendous. And it's a huge progress. Uh, how, wide, Mar, how widespread can this be? I mean, can this get to a point where if you have this type of damage, it will be very common to be able to have this? Yes, yes, but I want to distinguish the point David just yeah. made with what I said earlier. The 1.7 million people are people that lack a limb. This particular study is looking at people who had damage to the nerves up here that actually allow you to move your hands. So they still had their hands, but their hands weren't working. They made a prosthesis, they attached it, and the first training they did was they had you learn to use the fake hand or the new hand with your mind and then once you had done that, they gave you the option. Do you want your other hand, which is not useful, your original hand, amputated? That's a very specialized situation where people have what's called a brachial plexus injury. I think in the future, and also because of the great research from the Department of Defense, that this is going to apply to all people who have amputation, starting, of course, with our warriors, but then apply to civilians I mean, as well. And who pays for it? Let's say you have that issue. How do you... Does insurance cover this? Well, well this, not, this, not now. This, this is in the first initial phase, right. and it's going to probably pan out that they will pay for it. What it, what I also what find interesting is in our own field of robotic surgery, for example, for prostate cancer, 90% of the time we save the nerves 
in order to save the sexual function 10% of the time because the cancer has gone into the nerves we will take that nerve in order to save someone's life we used to take a piece of nerve from the lower extremity and implant it in the area where the nerve is gone to see if the sexual function will come back and the data was not as promising in this particular one they were able to really bring the muscle and the nerves and the graft and do the repair so they really have done an amazing job and it's working really well for them and same uh, thing with this I'm sorry to interrupt but same thing also with this bionic eye which is like a new invention maybe you want to make a comment about I, that. I want to make a comment also about what David does because the point he was starting to allude to David works with robotic surgery every day and in a way this is an extension of this we're working further and further into robotics where you don't just have some prosthesis that just hangs there that's kind of a, a space keeper you know you lose your leg you have a leg it's like a stump now we're actually able to innervate it and to get it useful again that kind of robotics in a way is an extension of robotic surgery which we've well, been you know, how the, eye, soon, right? the eye and then how soon will this be accessible to most people who need it well it, it's it's going through the trial it's done now in Europe and it's going to be available here. So far they have total of about seven of these type of patients out there. But you know, look like anything else. Starts. Fifteen years ago when I was starting to do robotic surgery for prostate cancer, people said like this is crazy. Today a lot of people are doing this. And when you were in the operating room a couple of years ago, we were able to really zoom in and see all these sensitive nerves around the organs and you, you were amazed compared to open surgery. Saving the nerve. How much we have changed and how far we've come. Exactly. You mentioned the eye of eye that can actually this is, serve as an eye. This is going on at Mayo Clinic and what they're doing there, remember that the retina of the eye is like a camera and in something called retinitis pigmentosa it's damaged and you can't see because your film basically is ex overexposed. Well what they're doing now is they're actually implanting a computer chip. They're actually implanting a computer chip in the back of the eye and then they're putting the computer on your hip and a camera at the outside of your eye. So you have the camera, it, it, it records the images, the computer on your thigh signals that chip at the back of your eye to signal the optic nerve of the brain. You can't see the way we can see, but maybe you could see the way Jordy could see on Star Trek Next Generation. In other words, you see an approximation see the light. of the light and, and, and you see some images. It, it, it's basically the whole retina, which is the receptors are not working. So what they have done is they have put in exactly what Mark said, the microchips, you have the camera, you have the processor. And a lot of these patients who have retinitis pigmentosa, they have tunnel vision. So they don't see the vision on the outside. They also don't have good night vision. So as a result of this 66 year old, person who was able to get this eye now he's able to see the light and also see his wife he, he wants to he has he's a job we hope, you like, by the way. we hope you like what you see when you, when you well, get he, want, back. he basically <laughs> wants to say that after 30 years of blindness now that he opened his eyes he wants to see the wife the same way hopefully she hasn't gained weight i guess that was a joke so anyway i said it that's right. <laughs> right, fascinating. You, it's technology. a big progress in technology. Definitely. It's really amazing. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Sounds like it.